Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Africa, Europe, Israel, and the United Kingdom. And welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I am Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining us today. This International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma webinar is held in observance of International Day of Support for Victims of Torture that took place yesterday, 26 June. Following ICMGLT style, international multidisciplinary participants will discuss inter- and multi-generational legacies of torture and of related traumas and losses to victim survivors, families, and communities, as well as professionals and descendants' attempts at pursuing support, peace, and justice. Your moderator, that's me, is a clinical psychologist, victimologist, traumatologist, and psychohistorian who has devoted much of her career to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights and to reparative justice. Our first presenter, Dr. Mary Fabry, is a member of the ICMGLT's Advisory Council and co-chair of the ICMGLT's Working Group on Indigenous Issues. She is a clinical psychologist whose career has focused on the treatment of torture survivors and training local providers in post-conflict settings to care for victims of human rights violations. Former senior director of the Marjorie Kovler Center for the, for the Treatment of Survivors of Torture in Chicago, Mary served as president of the United States National Consortium of Torture Treatment Programs for five years. Our second speaker, licensed psychologist Dr. Hawthorne Smith, Hawk for short, is director of the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture and associate clinical professor at the NYU School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. He is president of the United States National Consortium of Torture Treatment Programs. In addition, Dr. Smith is co-founder of Nawe Yon Inc., a nonprofit organization working primarily with refugees from Sierra Leone and other displaced Africans in New York. Our third speaker, Shari Appel, is a Zimbabwean who lives and works in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. Shari is both a psychologist and a forensic anthropologist. She has been involved for more than 20 years with exhumation and reburial of those murders in the 1980s in her region by the post-independent state. The need to, under, to honor the murdered dead remains an urgent need. <clears throat> in recent years, this has increasingly become work with the next generation of survivors as transgenerational trauma is now a reality. Last but not least, our fourth speaker, Carla Firstman, is a professor at the School of Law and Human Rights Center at the University of Essex, United Kingdom. Prior to joining academia in 2018, she worked as a director of anti-torture organization Redress, 
and with other civil society groups and intergovernmental organizations on human rights, victims' rights, and international justice. We have about an hour and a half for the webinar, though we have known to have run a bit over. Each speaker will talk for about 12 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. So you have all this time to decide on them, dear panelists. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to the full panel. I give the screen floor to Dr. Mary Fabry. Mary. Thank you, Yael. Let me pull up slides that people can follow. And let me make it larger. Let me do a slideshow. Slideshow. Oops. Slideshow. And start. Okay, there we go. Sorry for that little delay. But um, thank you, Yael. And I am, I also want to say it's just an honor to be on this panel with um, the, my colleagues who I just have admired their work over the years. Um, thank you all for joining us here. Um, so I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing and, and just to um, describe that multi-generational trauma is sometimes in the literature refer referred to as transgenerational trauma or intergenerational trauma, um, but it is a traumatic event like torture that's passed down from those who have directly experienced the event. That's the primary victim or survivor. It can be a single individual, it might be multiple family members, or it can be a collective trauma that has impacted a larger cultural, ethnic, racial, religious, or other community group. Um, let's see. Going forward. Okay. So the psychological consequences of torture are not clear cut, right? It, it's a broad range of possible symptoms that depends on the individual. But just generally speaking, it Survivors may be depressed, have higher levels of anxiety, have difficulty regulating their emotions because their central nervous system is always activated, develop low self-esteem from what has happened to them, come home with disturbed sleep and appetite patterns, be mistrustful and suspicious, um, have suicidal ideation or more passive suicidal wish, may turn to substance abuse to numb themselves and also may be vulnerable to um, express interpersonal violence. So the bottom line is this isn't an exhaustive list of possible responses to torture, but the bottom line is that torture changes a person. Um, and I'm going to go through some examples. Again, it's not the end all, but it is some samples of how a survivor may impact their family and how the, the transgenerational um, transmission begins. So a torture survivor may come home after their experience and physically isolate themselves, um, withdraw emotionally from others in their household. That leaves the family feeling abandoned, unloved, not experiencing the warmth and intimacy that may have existed before the torture, um, may even start feeling fearful of, of the return survivor and maybe even anger towards them. And it creates this feeling of insecurity in the family. Nobody feels safe within themselves or in their relationships with each other and in particular with the survivor. And that can lead to blaming yourself like, what am I doing wrong? How am I contributing to, to this? What should I be doing differently? Another survivor may come home full of fear and worry, 
and be overprotective and suspicious and mistrustful of anyone outside the family, maybe even within the family. And then because of that, become inappropriately aggressive towards others. Um, there is a strong need to control. When you're in a torture experience, you have no control. You don't have control over your environment or what's being done to you. And so when you come home, you want to control and it can lead to all these behaviors. And then family members may then become very fearful of the person who's returned and very worried about what's going on in their lives and not liking it at all. Um, others may come home and want to avoid everything. Um, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. So an imposed silence about what has happened is put onto the family and that there is an intolerance of any kind of conflict between members of the family. And it can really create this atmosphere of fear, fear of upsetting the survivor. Like you're walking on eggshells. You know, you don't want to upset them. You don't want to add to the burden they already are carrying. Um, so then family members might feel shameful and guilty if they contribute to any kind of increased distress in the family and in particular the survivor. And then also because there is no talking about what happened and about feelings, they may develop, especially children, develop their own explanation of why. And we know with children's um, psychological development, they're going to blame themselves, um, that they've done something wrong to result in this family distress. Again, sleep problems are very common in torture survivors when they return home. The nighttime is when there's no distractions. It's when you can't sleep. Um, racing thoughts, nightmares, that can disrupt every family member's sleep pattern. I'll give you a, a little example here. I worked with a woman who we discovered her as a torture survivor because her school-age son was falling asleep in class. And the teacher knew he was from a refugee experience. Um, but what we learned once we saw him was his mother, once her children went to bed, she would midnight start cooking a big elaborate traditional meal. And at 3 a.m. wake them up, come eat, eat. And then of course, after all that, they're aroused, they don't go back to sleep. So this child was falling asleep, but it led to us learning that his mom was a torture survivor and we were able to get her into treatment. But those are the kinds of things that disrupt normal family lives. And again, if you've been tortured and you've had no control over that experience, um, you can develop a negative outlook on life. Um, and that negative outlook, the suspiciousness and mistrust, the anger, the world is a dangerous place impacts every family member and their feelings about each other and, and their community. Some communities have solidarity, other communities have total mistrust of each other, and of course, the larger society. Um, drug and alcohol abuse, we all know in any circumstances, disrupts family life. It alters the relationship between family members. It models unhealthy unhealthy coping strategies, and may even lead to absences from home, even though what the survivor is trying to do is numb their emotional pain. In reality, it's creating more pain in the entire family. So if we look at family responses, given these just samples of how a survivor might be once they return to their family after being tortured, um, the family members might feel responsible for how the survivor is feeling and behaving. They might feel like they are unable to be a good child or a good spouse or a good parent, that they're failing the survivor. That can lead to resentment, irritability, lots of misunderstandings, especially if there's no communication going on. And then, especially among children, we'll see acting out behaviors, um, perhaps disobeying, 
staying out late, cutting class, whatever, but it creates, again, more distress within the family. So it makes sense then, if you look at these dynamics that get created, that not only does the survivor have their own pain and suffering, um, the family member may also suffer and develop depressive symptoms, even some of the symptoms of PTSD. They might somaticize, have lots of headaches, body aches, back aches, and then the behavioral problems that are often common in children. And thus, a pattern may evolve across generations, that immediate family receiving the survivor, the children of the survivor, their children, and so on. And the legacies of the trauma of torture continue. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our moderator during this presentation, um, because Dr. Daniele was a pioneer in really looking at the multi-generational transmission of trauma among Holocaust survivors and their families. And this is a quote from a chapter she wrote in 1985. Um, the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of responses of families of victim survivors to their Holocaust and post-Holocaust experiences emphasizes the need to guard against expecting all victim survivors to behave in a uniform fashion and to match appropriate therapeutic interventions to a particular form of reaction. That is a caution to all of us um, who are clinicians because there is no one treatment fits all. The implications for treatment is to look at individuals and family responses, what cultural resources are available, what worldviews do they embrace, what re religious beliefs do they practice, what kinds of support systems. We can't assume community support. We can't assume anything until we know these um, pieces of information. And I also would like, as I end, um, to direct you to the center's website, um, extensive resource library, you will really appreciate it. And then also, if you really want to know about the um, details of the different aspects of life that trauma can impact an individual, I'd encourage you to look at the Daniele Inventory of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, which is also available on the website. And with that, I'll end and thank you for listening and for caring about this issue. Thank you so much, Mary, for this comprehensive presentation. And thank you for this uh, nod to, me, to my work, <laughs> to our work together. Uh, I'm very touched. Uh, Hawk. Uh, the floor and the screen, everything is yours. Outstanding. Thank you so very much. And uh, once again, thanks to the entire International Center for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma. And all of you who are in attendance today, um, Dr. Daniele, thank you. I especially wanted to thank Mary. I have the honor of following you in, in the order now, but thank you for reaching out to me and allowing me to, to be part of this. It's really wonderful. And last week, uh, last Monday, it was, um, we had a rehearsal for this and it fell on the very first, um, the very first day of, um, that we were celebrating Juneteenth. Okay, my slides don't seem to be moving forward. Let's see, there we are. Oh, good. Um, it's all happening now. Um, and it was hard, I took the day off and I really felt bad about missing this meeting because this means so much to me and it's such a, an esteemed group of folks that I get a chance to talk with, but I felt that it was really important to acknowledge and to spend time with the family on a day that is dedicated now finally for the multi-generational transmission of not only trauma, but the resilience that we feel. So I felt it was time to take that day off. So I wanted to acknowledge that to my, to my colleagues and say that Sometimes when I'm thinking about my family's past and, and where we've been, and I'm descended from slaves on both sides of my family here in the States and in the Caribbean, and I can think back to my grandparents, and perhaps their parents, and I know them by name, 
but there are multiple generations of folks that I do not know their names. The people who somehow managed to survive the capture, um, the detention on the West African coast, the Middle Passage, seasoning in the Caribbean, being born into servitude and perhaps not even seeing any possibility that your children would ever escape from that to the era of Jim Crow and everything that we're living through now, there are times when I just wanna take a respectful moment to remember or perhaps pray, and I do not know the names. But one of the blessings that I have, that we have in this work we do, and I'll speak from the eye, is that I get a chance to meet other individuals who are making the same sacrifice, the same effort for their families in the current day that those folks did for me generations ago. And I've taken to calling them the crossroads generation. As I, I really think about that in terms of within the, the black American tradition and many religious traditions in the Caribbean and West Africa, crossroads is a place of magic. It's, it's both profane and divine. It is a, a place where worlds intersect and you can draw upon your past to move forward into the future. But when we look at this crossroads generation with whom we are working now, and I will say that here at the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, it is largely asylum seekers or those who are seeking some sort of refuge in this country now because of the ongoing stressors and the repeated multi-generational stressors they have been dealing with at home. So there's a great deal of trauma. And uh, Mary has already talked to you in great depth and specificity about that. But think about the recurrent stressors. We're not just looking at a really bad day back in Democratic Republic of Congo several months ago. We are looking, open your papers and you, you see about the people who are making the treacherous voyage across the Mediterranean. We are seeing more and more people here at Bellevue who are coming up from Ecuador or Brazil and all the way through South and Central America, dealing with the Darien gap between Colombia and Panama where people are dying, um, being attacked in, in the rainforest, all of these things to try to have this possibility of freedom. Mm -hmm. And then once coming here, and I'm gonna step into this subject a little bit more in the next slide, the uncertainty. Just because someone comes here with a true history of trauma, the recurrent stressors that keep things alive in the present does not mean that the USCIS or any of the other accepting things will look at them favorably or in a timely fashion. But despite all of these things, our clients are trying to do this. They are putting themselves in the middle of this crossroads to try and put the next generations of their family on a better footing. And, you know, it's just, in some ways, it's a very painful irony, because let's say we're looking at parents who are trying to assure a better future for their children, but the only way to do that is to absent themselves from the direct parenting interactions with their clients. And these family separations are something, and I want to touch on this now, we are dealing I'll speak from Bellevue, but it's all the way across the country with an unseen family separation crisis. We, we, we get the vivid images from the border, but what we are seeing now is what our clients are frequently referring to as the second torture. Mm -hmm. I run a group for French-speaking African survivors. We're in our 26th year now, and a lot of what I'm going to speak to you about comes from that context. But if you want to see tears in a group session. Every once in a while, someone will talk about their torturous experiences, etc. And that is something the group generally deals with in a pretty business-like fashion. Mm -hmm. When someone talks about the ongoing familial separations, missing the birthdays, missing um, the, the, the ability to say goodbye to someone who has passed away while they're here, etc. That's when the tears come. Some of it has been exacerbated. It's already a waterlogged system, but during the previous administration, they took what had been a longstanding practice where people come into the country and are dealt with sort of in the order in which they come. They call that first in, first out, FIFO. The previous administration turned that on its head to what they call LIFO, 
last in, first out, because the presupposition is that most of these stories are just erroneous anyway. But the people who have been here for a long time, maybe they're connected with programs like ours. Maybe they have a therapist, they have lawyers, they're hard to get out. Let's deal with the people who are first arriving. So we are seeing many people now who have been in this country for at least five years and have never had their even their, their first asylum interview. These are the family separations we don't see on TV. These are the people who are driving Uber or Lyft until two in the morning. They hurry home, they call their kids so that they can say hello to them before they go to school. And the kids saying, mama, daddy, do you still love us? What's happening? What's going on? I'll give just a couple of examples and I'm gonna go very quickly because I know we don't have much time. There was one particular group session where in this particular time there were only men involved. Usually it's, it's um, co-educational, et cetera. But there were six men, all of whom were in this situation of being separated from their families. And someone was telling the story of how every year because he's driving a lift, he's doing this, he can send money back to his daughter and always plans her birthday party with her and pays for everything. And at the end of going through this process, he asked the question, hey, baby, I'm a good father, right? And his daughter responded, how would I know? How would I know if you're a good father? I don't know you. And he cried, the other gentleman at this table cried and we were able to engage in sort of a, a group discussion where I asked each member of the group to look at the others at the table and say, are these people who have abandoned their responsibilities? Are these people who just came to New York to see Broadway shows and live a better life? Or are these actually good parents who were giving the ultimate sacrifice to help their families? And everyone was easily able to identify the others as good fathers. But then to let them know that those five people that they respect that they see as good fathers are also looking at them as a good father, as someone who is trying to make this effort. And it was really, really important. And again, I think that these are things that are beyond perhaps what we as non-directly involved clinicians can say and come from other community members. This is part of the crux of how they're getting past this. The last example I give on this slide is there was a gentleman from Guinea who was ready to go home. He came into the group session and said, I'm going home. I know that if they know I'm back, they will capture me. They will probably, they will definitely torture me. They'll probably kill me, but I need to hug my babies. My daughters are crying. I can't do anything. I don't care what happens to me. I need to hug my babies. And group members became very involved in this, obviously. And there was a gentleman from Congo and I'll, I'll skip his history, but what he was able to say to this young man is that you can no longer think about your family as the family you left behind you. You have to think about your family as the family in front of you and that you are swimming through these horrific circumstances right now to be reunited and again, to set your family on a different trajectory in history. So what are some of the ways that these group members that, that you know, some of the wisdom that they share and this even steps into, you know, suicidal ideation, things like that. Clients letting them, each other know to not give the victory to those who do not deserve it. In some ways, it's almost a subversive approach to healing. As the French would say, le bien-être est la meilleure vengeance. It's like, well, living well is the best vengeance. How do we not just survive, but thrive? Within that is the l'esprit de partage, which is a sense of shared humanity where if people are able to sort of place themselves, not just as that isolated person at the crossroads with the weight of the world on their shoulders, but as part of a movement of people who are trying to do things for those who are left behind. As they say, you know, um, sorrow that is shared is half, joy that is shared is multiplied. And one of the things, and I know you're gonna hear this with the next couple of presentations, it does not have to be therapy to be therapeutic. And we're gonna see where anthropological, where legal issues, where the rubber really hits the road, anything that I think helps us to value someone's humanity and let them know that they are not just needed, or they're not just needy, excuse me, if they are needed, they can become part and parcel of one another's healing experience, what they're doing for their families. And as it says at the very end, nothing is easy, nothing is easy but everything is possible. And this is the voice of 
a survivor that says not not just a victim. Very last thing I'll say, and I know it's time to move on. There was a uh, a session more than twenty years ago I had, and there was an escaped slave from Mauritania who asked the question, "How do we change the world, or how do we at least survive in the world?" And I really thought that they're never going to come to a consensus on this, but I was wrong because I frequently am. And what my group members came up with that night were three things. They said, la sagesse, le courage, et l'espoir, wisdom, courage, and hope. And they went further and they said that if we have two of these three qualities, no matter which two, it's insufficient. Because if we're courageous and hopeful, but we lack wisdom, we're probably gonna go about our efforts in a way that's ineffective and we're gonna fail. Conversely, if we're wise and hopeful, but we lack courage, we will never act on our predispositions and we'll be locked in a prison of inertia. But you know the people we're working with, you know the wisdom is there, the courage is there. But what is hard to hold on to for these folks standing in the crossroads is hope. But where they went further, and perhaps where we as clinicians and service providers can jump in is that they explained that hope is not so much something you have as it is something you do. It is an active comportment, an engagement, an attitude, a way of leaning into the world. It is literally an active capacity to hope. And perhaps most importantly, that active capacity to hope is something that can be shared. That's how I understand what we do in the group or in our program or in this field or fields that we are involved in. We are finding ways to actually share that capacity to hope so that our clients can use the wisdom and courage they already present to move forward. And with that, let me stop. And again, thank you so very much for having me. Thank you, Hope. Thank you. I, I knew you would be very moving. Uh, you exceeded my <laughs> you exceeded my expectations. <laughs> and as I said, we have a lot more work to do, uh, which we will. Actually, one webinar we will do because of you, with you, is I don't know their names. Okay? So this is for us to make an, a, a meet, to have a meeting on that. Uh, uh, that is uh, the issue of names and naming and all that is uh, profoundly key, profoundly a key to so much. And actually, Shari, Shari is in the in the work of connecting names to remains. Uh, Shari, uh, the screen and the floor is yours. I, I am thank you very excited. much. I'm so excited. Well, thank you very much. I must just warn your technical person, I've already ducked in and out twice. So if I disappear, will you rescue me? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on Zoom here from, from Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is just go straight to, to share screen and, and talk a little bit um, about the work that I do. And also, I just wanted to warn people that there are going to be bones, okay, skeletons and human remains. Um, so if you might just want to look away um, if you don't want to see human remains and perhaps just listen to, to the presentation. Okay. Right. Um, there we are. And um, I'm struggling a bit. I've got to get rid of this. I'm trying to get to, I've got other things in the way here. There we go. Um, I hope. Um, okay, but just let me go up. Yeah, okay, so th this is the, my, my just my, my disclaimer at the beginning here about skeletal remains. Okay, I have had full permissions from families to show the remains. Um, families want people to see uh, the truth that they, the bones of their dead can tell. Um, so, you know, rest assured that, you know, families have, have actually asked for these stories to be told. 
Um, okay, so I mean, Zimbabwe, many of you probably don't know much about us. We're a, a Southern African country, which, which was known as Rhodesia from the 1890s until 1979. And of course, like all colonial Africa, um, th those were very brutal times. And there was, we, we had a, a war of liberation, um, which became very intense in the late 70s, resulting in, in independence in April 1980. And um, Robert Mugabe was our first prime minister and he remained our prime minister until 2018. Okay, so for 34 years and he became increasingly dictatorial um, and repressive as the, as the years went on. Um, and in particular, but in fact, I mean, you know, for many people, they think that this was, this was something that happened in the later part of his, of his rule of Zimbabwe, but in actual fact, right in the 1980s, independence was 1980. And in, from 83 to 85, there were massacres of um, people living in the Western part of the country. You can see Bulawayo there. That's where um, I've spent most of my life. Um, I'm a, a Zimbabwean born. And you can see that in 1983, there were massacres north of, of where I live in Bulawayo and in 1984 to the south. And then in 1985, there were a lot of enforced disappearances. And for me, you know, ambiguous loss is a form of torture. Um, you know, Hawke was talking about le less recognized, um, you know, forms of torture, like, you know, family separations and so on. In, in cultures such as, you know, you, you get in many parts of Africa, to be separated, your, your ancestors are part of your family. Um, and to not know where they are, to not know what happened to them um, is a form of, of, of um, spiritual torture. Um, but again, I, I, that's not just here, it's everywhere, which is why I've got a picture there of the Twin Towers coming down. There's still a thousand uh, people who were never identified from the, the time the Twin Towers went down. They're still DNAing tiny scraps of bone, trying to find everyone. Um, and you've also got uh, M8, flight MH370, um, which again crashed in the sea almost, well, more than eight years ago now. Those people have never been found and those families are still wanting closure, you know, wanting to know what happened. So just to say, it's not just um, a Zimbabwean thing. Okay, so in Zimbabwe, though, ancestors are very important. They are part of the lives of the living. Um, where am I? Oh, there we go. Okay, I've said that the angry spirits of the unburied, dishonored dead are the most serious legacy of the massacres. And this is what I was told as a clinical psychologist who went out and began just listening to people, which is what psychologists are supposed to do. And, you know, they weren't very interested in, in um, bringing um, terms which didn't exist, you know, in, in the local languages such as PTSD or mixed anxiety, depression disorder. And they said, look, our problem is we haven't honored our dead. We have droughts, disease, failed marriage, infertility, failed development projects. And we know that this is not, not going to be ever healed. Um, how can we forget to honor our dead um, and, and still be at peace for ourselves? Um, and people who haven't been properly buried are known as bones in the forest. And there's actually a ritual um, every year in, at the end of winter, before spring, when people will go out and collect um, the bones in the forest um, to, to bury them properly, because the idea is, is that culturally it's not right for bones to be exposed. Um, well, and again, I think we could say that about all cultures. Um, but it's, it's very, very profoundly the situation for people in our region where these massacres are still denied and, and all the dead are not equal in Zimbabwe. It's not possible to um, be buried depending on who you are. Um, this is our Ogotula Forensic Anthropology team, or Ogotula meaning peace in Sindabeli. Um, and um, I'm a forensic anthropologist, but our, our team has been trained partly by myself and also partly by the Argentinian Forensic Anthropology Team, the Missing Persons Task Team in South Africa, um, and the University of Pretoria over, you know, quite a number of years now. So we have a, a fabulous barefoot forensic team. And um, we realized that in order to heal the living, uh, to heal the living, we had to heal the dead. Um, and, you know, some of the things which just enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings result in is denial of the right to know. Um, people don't know what it is that happened. 
Um, and that's also linked to the right to truth. And these are, are rights which are now recognized by the UN, actually, um, as fundamental rights. And in fact, in, in, in some Latin American countries, the right to mourn is now in the Bill of Rights um, of many countries because it's such a fundamental thing. And in fact, I think, you know, what is it? How do we know about other cultures around the world? Um, very often it's, it's by how they buried their dead. Okay, you know, what, what, is, what are the pyramids if not a, a giant tomb? You know, what do we know about early men and, you know, you know, previous civilizations? It's very often defined by how people bury and what they bury with their dead. And, and um, you know, so I think it's one of the most profound things and it cuts across all cultures, whether that means um, cremation, you know, if you're Hindu, whether it means burial, whether it means putting bones out for the vultures to eat, which it does um, in some places. Okay, this here is Daniel. He's one of the people we exhumed. Um, and for me, you know, one of the things which is, is very, very profound is, is that when people, um, um, you know, when, when people um, have a disappeared person in the family, what they often tend to do is, is they disappear the person themselves even more. Um, this photograph no one in the family had seen because, you know, the, the dead person becomes like the elephant in the room, if you like. No one can talk about that person, especially in a situation like ours where the, the people who are responsible for the murders still run the country, even though Mugabe is done, his vice president took over. So to, to have to reach that story and, and, then, and then what happened to Daniel while well, he was murdered by the state? Okay, to reach that point is, is a very dangerous thing to do. And so you just don't talk about him at all in the end. So one of the things which really struck me, and you know, it continues to strike me, is almost always when we rebury, um, suddenly somebody will show up with a photo that nobody's seen for more than 30 years. Um, and for example, here yesterday, when one of his daughters saw the photos for the first time, she said she had never seen her father before. Although she used to dream about her father a lot, he had no face in her dreams. Yet these photos existed, um, and but you know they were hidden in a shoebox under somebody's bed because it wasn't possible to show the pictures. It wasn't possible to say anything um, about the disappeared. Okay, here's Daniel with his family. I call this a double portrait. Um, there are the bones. Uh, Daniel was actually shot through the head and shoved into a, a cave on top of a hill. Um, a very sort of clandestine burial. Um, he, he, that's one of his sons hold, holding a picture there. He was three months old when his father died um, and knew nothing about his father. He was raised by an uncle and, and didn't even know that he had a, that anyone else was his father. Okay, you can see the man in the, with the big brass badge on is um, the local chief, that's Chief Mate um, of Omzangwani. We always work with the traditional leadership. We're guided by them. They always attend the exhumations. They make sure the right rituals take place and so on because you know what's important is that people finally, finally have the chance to do the right thing, you know, by their dead. Okay, this is Julius Mbulo Nyati, who we exhumed in, in 2018. He was also killed um, by 5th Brigade and buried on, on the side of a hill. Um, you can see the man in the black jacket there, that's his son, Chris. And you can see how shallow the bones are. And you can see the bone just ahead of Chris's shoe there. He was about buried about two inches deep. Okay, and that is the, the aunt there who is saying prayers and undertaking rituals. Um, I don't know if you can see a woman with, in a red scarf peeping out behind the tree. She's actually the local chief in that area. Um, and as you can see, we exhume with the families, you know, literally on the edge of the, of the grave because, you know, for us, it's part of this right to truth and the right to know. Okay, there's Chris, the son of the deceased. Uh, Zimbabwe is an open coffin burial um, you know, culturally, and, um, you know, so we always lay all the bones out in anatomical order um, so that everybody can, can see the dead. Um, this here is Chris's sister, um, who was three years old when her father died. And she asked me to take this picture because she said, I want a picture of me and my father. You know, that's, you know, the picture. And again, this was a picture that nobody in the family had seen. Um, in fact, until the day they came to, to look at the human remains, which were laid out, you know, in our, in our um, offices. Um, and what really moved me about this is, can you see how she looks exactly like her dad? She's got his nose, she's got his hairline, she's got his chin, um, and she never knew, okay, all the years she, she grew up, and you can see she's a mother now herself, she has a baby on her back. 
Okay, this is Justin and Tambi who, who we exhumed in 2019. They, they were murdered, a young couple in their 20s. Um, and he'd come from town to rush her back, in, back into, up out of the rural areas where she was. Um, because he heard that soldiers were there raping women. Um, but unfortunately, just short of the railway line, they ran into 5th Brigade, who shot them dead. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but there's a little black box there. That's actually a transistor radio. Um, and one of the things which, again, was very interesting to me was when, when we exhumed them, so many you know, school children and generations who knew they were buried there said that the, the railway siding was haunted and the radio, you'd hear the radio playing if you were there after dark at night and, and you know the children were all terrorized. Everybody knew someone had died and been buried there, but the radio was just a very important part. Okay, there again, we can see family members in the grave pointing at the radio um, and you know saying prayers, undertaking rituals and all dressed in their best okay, to come and attend this very important event, which was the returning, the digging up of Justin and Tembi. Now, this was their son, Lani, who was six months old when both of his parents were killed. And he was raised by his aunt and he was never told uh, that, that, that these were not his parents. Um, so literally here he was meeting them for the first time. And he particularly asked me to take that picture in the middle there. He was also for the first time on this day shown a photograph, which included his father. And you can see on the right there, He's pointing at a photo and saying, is this one my father? Is that one my father? And his uncle is pointing and saying, that one is your father. Um, and he stroked his father's head and had this conversation. Anyway, we then buried um, Justin and Tembi. What I always do is I take the, the bones out and then we, I lay them out in anatomical order and explain the trauma um, and why the remains are in the state they are, you know, in the coffin while the, while the family watches. And again, you can see women and men sitting watching this event. And there's Olani in the checked shirt in the middle, and that's Tembi, his mother. And he just gazed at her for about 10 straight minutes and didn't say a word, just gazing into the coffin at his mother's remains. Imagine, he was six months old when she died, and this was literally the first com communing with her that he ever had, um, you know. The thing which also interested me here is that you can see that little boy sitting down there with the blue cap on, on the left, and that was Olani's son. So the grandson of Justin and Tembi. And it, I found it very unusual to see uh, such a young child at an event like this. And Kalani said to me, I was lied to. I never knew the truth. And I, I never knew who my parents were. And this is my son's chance to know what happened to his grandparents. Um, and, and so he has to be part of this process. Um, this was in 2021, because after the burial, we then had COVID for a year. Um, so this was then sometime later in 2021, that the unveiling of the tombstone of Justin and Tembi at their rural home, buried, you can see um, a grave um, behind the woman in, in the peach outfit. Okay, they are now buried and have the fanciest grave of all um, in the family graveyard, which is just outside the fence there. And this was a truly joyous occasion. I don't know if you can see how happily sort of dancing and larking around um, the sister of Tembi and the brother of Justin are there. And there's Olani, and you can remember how sad he looked when he was meeting his father's remains for the first time. But here he was just feeling absolutely buoyant and happy because at last he, you know, was able to do this thing for his parents um, mm -hmm. and to be there for them and, and to own up, you know, to everything that had happened and to make sure that they were buried in the right place and honored. Um, so this process, you know, that, that we go through with our exhumations, and, and I'm way over time, so I'm going to stop, but, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a long process, it's, it's not an event, um, and it's about, um, you know, working with families for a long time to establish where are they dead, and, and, and who are the eyewitnesses, and how do we know who's buried where, and so on, then there's the exhumation, then there's the reburial, then there's the tombstone, um, erection and throughout that time you know we're with the, with the families working through various processes um, so anyway I'm just going to stop there thank you very much oh. <laughs> yeah when you become friends with Sherry you learn that you don't want her to stop you want her to continue and teach you more and more and more um, we, we at the center are so blessed 
as you see just from this webinar. Uh, Carla. Carla is the lawyer in the bunch. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize in advance. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead, my dear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great pleasure to be here and to participate in this webinar. Um, I think you've heard in different kinds of ways from the other panelists about the different ways that torture produces multi-generational effects. It's sadly, it's not exceptional. It stems from the nature of torture and the way it impacts survivors and their families and how families integrate this experience of torture into their collective understanding of family and community relations, but also of history. But what I will look at now is the extent to which the anti-torture framework, so the law, the treaties, et cetera, the way it accounts for these multi-generational effects. And I think the first thing to say is that it doesn't really, it does or it doesn't yet. And here, I think we can say that we're, we're in a trajectory. There is greater understanding of multi-generational and intergenerational effects, but law can be slow. And this is one of those areas where the psychology is leading and the law is following. So we're in, we're in a trajectory. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that it isn't so long ago that it was debated about whether torture was long lasting or lifelong in its effects. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly recognized now that the impact of torture can be lifelong for the direct survivor, but from a legal perspective in terms of cases, how harm was understood, this was certainly not something that was necessarily the case 40 years ago. If you managed to survive torture and you got to a position of relative safety, it was kind of expected that you were to move on with your life because everything was basically okay for you to do so. So I think it, it's taken some time to recognize that actually torture produces lifelong effects. Um, so we're in the process of trying to recognize the intergenerational, multi-generational effects. So like most human rights frameworks, the anti-torture framework focuses on three main things. First, the obligation to prevent torture. So the positive steps that states must take to ensure that torture doesn't happen in the first place a strong legal framework, training of law enforcement, uh, the rights of detainees who, uh, when, they, when they're imprisoned. These are the kinds of things that we would think about for the obligation to prevent torture. Second, the obligation to prohibit torture. So the obligation to ensure that torture is a crime, that it's possible to investigate and prosecute torturers whenever and wherever torture happens and the obligation to combat impunity for torture. And thirdly, the obligation to repair torture. So the obligation to address the consequences of torture, to provide reparation to victims and their families, to take measures to guarantee non-repetition. So some of these measures are better able to address multi-generational effects than others. But it's probably fair to say that none of these measures yet does a good job at addressing multi-generational effects. So there's much more to explore and much more to do. So starting with the obligation to prevent the multi-generational harm caused by torture and to prohibit it, there are a number of interesting challenges which are going forward now which are being brought in relation to climate change and environmental protection, 
on behalf of future generations. So the idea being that the actions of today will have an impact on future generations, which justify greater preventive actions now to prevent future harms. Part of these cases are about the extent to which future harms are scientifically knowable. And increasingly, we know that, they, that it is knowable. Um, but in a sense, we are projecting what we don't fully know now in order to make sure that we can prevent better, to prevent what, what will ultimately happen. In a way, the need for these cases is because the harms are only beginning to materialize. So if one frames the cases relying on the harms of present day only, you wouldn't get a full enough appreciation of the harm because it hasn't fully materialized. So looking at the cases in this kind of way allows us to take into account the impact of the crime or the violation, not only in the present day, but also into the future. And this is really important for how we characterize the harm, the imperative pre to prevent and to prohibit and what steps we must take to cease the wrongful conduct. Mm -hmm. So if we look at this in relation to torture, it's absolutely relevant. It gives us a much better understanding of the multi-generational effects that these increase the imperative to prevent and prohibit torture. So because of the multi-generational effects, we should be, it should be incumbent on us to better prevent and to better prohibit. It gives a better appreciation of the seriousness of the crime and the consequences of the failure to pre prevent and prohibit. But also it requires greater emphasis on care and support to families and communities precisely to counteract the intergenerational tra transmission of trauma, for instance. So this is why uh, prevention and, and prohibition of torture can be seen through an in intergenerational and multi-generational um, impact. But looking to the right to reparation, mm -hmm. there are several further impacts. First, do descendants inherit the right to reparation mm -hmm. established through the past torture of their ancestors? It's quite an interesting question. Unfortunately, from a legal perspective, the general answer would be no. Um, from an inheritance perspective, the descendants wouldn't inherit. It's not established under human rights law and it's not evidenced by the practice either. So claims to compensation for the harm caused by torture extinguish with the death of the claimant. A descendant will only inherit a reparation award that is already due, um, but, not, um, but not one which hasn't yet been fully made clear. But there are other ways to look at the issue outside of the lens of inheritance. And here I think is really where we need to look much more carefully. First, descendants do have the right to receive reparation if they can show that they have suffered in their own right on account of the past torture of their ancestors. So precisely what we're talking about in this session. So there's a need to show the link between the initial harm and the suffering of the descendants. This can be, one could argue, easiest to do in the case of a dependent who clearly suffers by a parent's inability to provide for them economically or someone who suffers psychologically because of the moral harm suffered by the parent. But for longer term multi-generational effects, it must be possible to show how the harm continues to impact in the present day. This doesn't require the harm to have stayed still. It can certainly change, it can evolve, it can accentuate in some ways and also decrease in importance in other ways. What's important is the causation. So the link between the current suffering and the past suffering. 
Um, another possibility of how to look at this is to show that the torture itself is continuing. So not only that the harm is continuing, but the torture continues. This is perhaps clearest when the torture stems from some form of discrimination of a community or a group, which still continues. So if we look at historic wrongs, which are continuing to the present day, the torture is continuing. It just has different facets. Mm -hmm. um, so the continuing impact on the discriminated group, which can be tied to the initial harm, but might also take on new dimensions with time. So it's not only showing that the harm continues, but that the violation or crime is continuing against different members of the same group. So these issues are increasingly being recognized by the courts, but in a very preliminary, limited way. So what's fair to say is that um, there is some recognition of these principles, but not enough and not in the clearest possible way. So it's, we have much more to go. Recently, the International Criminal Court, for instance, considered the possibility of multi-generational transmission of harm in a case concerning Uganda. So it recognized that the multi-generational transmission of harm manifested in the form of, for instance, the loss of the life plan, transgenerational trauma, as well as the harm suffered collectively by individual members of the family or community. But while courts continue to grapple with how to show the connection between the initial harm and the harm to descendants, the fact that the principles are beginning to be recognized is a very good start. So in the International Criminal Court case, the judges didn't ultimately recognize that connection. So one could say that it's a negative, but indeed they recognize the possibility of a connection. So it, it simply sets us a clear path of where we need to go to demonstrate more scientifically the nature of the connection and also to broaden the field significantly to show that a harm can evolve. It doesn't have to be the same harm. Causation means that there, there is a beginning there's a middle and the ends. The end is connected to the beginning, but it doesn't have to be the same as the beginning. So I think we're part of a continuing story. Um, so am I pessimistic or optimistic? I'm relatively optimistic um, because I can see the way in which the field has opened up in recognizing lifelong trauma, which is a significantly important developments from where we were, let's say 40 years ago, 50 years ago, where it was expected that any kind of harm, particularly relating to psychology, was going to be short term. So I think we, we, we have evolved significantly. And additionally, the, the biological impacts of psychological harm, which is something we, we haven't talked about in this seminar, is another area worth, worthy of further exploration from the perspective of causation and evidence. So I'll stop there. Thank you. You see why she's on our webinar. I just want to challenge you immediately, Carla, <laughs> as usual in our friendship. I'm quoting from the definition of victim of crime in the Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power, which is not legally binding, so you don't have to say that. What's important is that it was adopted by the remedy resolution. Okay, so let me just quote. Uh, and I'm quoting just very briefly because, as usual, we are running over time and there's so much more to say. A person may be considered a victim regardless of whether the perpetrator is identified, apprehended, prosecuted, or convicted, and regardless of the familial relationship 
between the perpetrator and the victim. This declaration, by the way, uh, was adapted in 1985. I had much to do with these words. Okay. The term victim also includes, where appropriate, the immediate family or dependents of the direct victim and persons who have suffered harm in intervening to assist victims in distress or prevent victimization. Uh, all I'm saying is we already sort of put here and there uh, keys to open those doors. I think, I think we're in a tra trajectory. So the words that you've said, um, which are words I, I, I know well as well, it's, it's, it's part of this, the same story in the sense that um, family members are recognized as, depending on the circumstance, either direct or indirect victims. Um, but if one is talking about multi-generational -generation, transmission of trauma, it's one further step. Right. Um, so one is looking at how to connect the initial to the, to the wider. And I think really what we need to look at, particularly for um, what some people refer to as historic injustices, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's great language and I don't like that language, but for, uh, for, for injustice, which has gone on for generations and generations, like, like slavery, like colonialism, like racism, um, one, one doesn't want to stop at uh, the immediate family. And one, one needs to go much further. So one just needs to look for the different kinds of linkages. Absolutely. Uh, I do want to add here, before we go to the rest, to the conversation among the panel and to the question and answers, um, that in the center, in the library, which uh, Mary so kindly mentioned in her presentation, we have a special section called Victims' Rights, Rights of Future Generation, and Reparative Justice. Those of you who are interested in the connection, the multidisciplinary connections we are alluding to, please go there. Uh, we, we put there everything we know of. Uh, that should be included. If you know of any other instrument that should be included, write to us immediately and it will be immediately added. Uh, of course, Carla was helpful in creating that section. I also want to go back to the Daniele inventory for multi-generational legacies of trauma. It is today the golden, gold, measure uh, in the field database that was created exactly to be able to assess scientifically multi-generation, intergenerational and multi-generational legacies of trauma. Uh, many of you in the audience, I can see from, from some of the names, are involved in studying, using the inventory to study your own groups, your own populations. And I hope many more will. So we together create an in a worldwide international database that will in fact provide what Carla challenged us to provide. Uh, for me, it's a mission. For, please join me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's the same as um, we talk to, to in, in Germany, there are reparations for the survivors, but not for the children who are suffering to this day, or sometimes their children. Okay, so th there should be a mission here. Very important. 
So let me go back to the panel. Uh, you have about seven minutes to ask each other questions, comment on each other's presentations. Uh, and before I open uh, the floor to everyone in the audience as well, please. Anyone? Remember to unmute yourself. Mary, you're unmuted, if that's a sign. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, okay. Carla, you're next. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Hawk, I'm, I'm really, uh, I was really struck by how supportive the men are, were of each other, but also in that interaction with the father desperately wanting to be acknowledged as a good father as his daughter, you know, from his daughter, because he's able to provide from afar, some you know resources, financial resources for them. Um, it, I to me, it was such a poignant example, though, of what's happening in the family. Um, that you know, you're working with the absentee <laughs> in this group, and that's one circumstance. But then there's the families left behind who they don't understand the system. Right, they don't. They, I know with a lot of asylees I worked with, the the family left behind thought, oh, they started a new family. We've been abandoned, and so that dynamic that when there is reunification, I don't know if in your group there's been any reunification, but I remember reunification is such a difficult period because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there is all these misunderstandings. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that feeds so well into the overarching structure of what we're discussing today, that it really is this sort of inter and multi-generational transmission. And one of the things that happens is when someone is able to go through the process, they get their asylum, family reunification, a family comes, they come to a group session. It's this beautiful celebratory sort of thing. But then there's also the conversations you know, people are giving a lot of advice to the family that's just arrived. Here's what the states are like. Here's what, look out for this. Don't do this, etc. But then there are always those questions. What was helpful for you? What helped you to keep things together back at home? And one of the things that comes up is the ongoing communication. Those difficult phone calls, because, you know, in individual therapy, I'll see it. You know, people just, I, I don't even answer the phone when I get a phone call from home because it's either bad news or it's someone crying that they need this or that and I just can't take it anymore but sometimes having it reinforced how important those conversations are and and just you know it continuing to establish that hope that capacity to hope among folks is an amazing thing and then families come here and a lot of the acculturation difficulties and these mm -hmm. teens who haven't been with a parent for so long and they, you know, and these are problems. <laughs> these are things to be dealt with. And sometimes I will just remind the client that these are indeed client, these are indeed problems. That these are the problems we were looking for a year ago, <laughs> you know, when we didn't have access to the family and all, not trying to minimize anything that's going on now, but at least we have the possibility now to engage in this situation in a way that can help move the family forward. So it is a, a continuation. And again, the group is there for that because many people have gone through some of those processes as well. But um, yeah, there's never a dull moment, nor is there a lack of opportunity to intervene. And if I can ask a question of Carla then, it's because, you know, some of these problems are systemic, right? At least in the United States, the whole asylum process is broken. Um, the delays, the, 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 you know, it's just, what can we do? I mean, that's one area that I have really am frustrated and felt you know, those three things, wisdom, hope, and courage, it's like, it's really hard to maintain when you can't move anyone forward. Can, what, what can, is, are there things you can think of that, I know you're in the UK, but it's like, what can we do to help? She's all over the place, actually. <laughs> and, 
No, thank you. I think it's a really important question. And of course, it's a really difficult time in the US for, for, legal, for legal remedies, given recent uh, Supreme Court rulings. But, but I would say one thing that the US has, which is wonderful and great, is great advocates. And I, th I think that's really important to use, to continue to use, to look for uh, different voices that can, can raise these issues with government in different ways. In other countries, I would say, you know, bringing the one case to which can have a positive result and then break through and lead to other precedents is often the way that the law is used for transformation. In the US, I don't know that that would currently be possible. It's more a question of raising voices and advocacy. Um, but but I, I, think, I think it's uh, not to get bogged down and, and in a way, I think this is something with, which Hawk, Hawk said, which is we have to be courageous and recognize that even if we're in a bad period, we need to persevere. Um, I, I think that's really important just to, to keep going and to maintain the momentum, even though in the short term, we may not be successful. I'm gonna just turn quick, uh, quickly to, to the comment I wanted to make, which was to, to Shari's presentation. I was really moved by the transformational impact of your forensic work in relation to the ability for families to acknowledge uh, what had happened. And that silence which surrounds the killings, the deaths, the disappearances, which somehow was broken through the forensic process, I think is really powerful. And I just wondered if you had anything to add to that, just because I found it so, so interesting and so important. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it is, it is a, a, an impactful process and it's a very intense and wonderful one to be part of actually. Um, you know, because literally you're millimeter by millimeter exposing the truth um, and it's a slow process, you know, and, and it involves a lot of, you know, people I've, I've found quite often here don't think that talking is a cure. Um, and, and I think it is. Um, but people will talk if they have the if they need, know they have to talk in order to get the bones back, which is what they want. Um, so, so it becomes talking with a very practical purpose, um, you know, so that's the first part of it. And, and, and it, it begins a process of reclaiming the person who's dead, because I'm saying, how old were they? How tall were they? What's their medical history? You know, all of these sorts of things. And people have to sit and reimagine the, the dead person often for the first time in decades. So, so it's a real um, bringing back um, into memory. So recovery of memory recovery of family history, you know, which happens through those processes. But I also often say that exhumation is, is, uh, does actually what psychotherapy does metaphorically, which is it digs up the past, it has a jolly good look at it, it says, what is it trying to tell us? And then you lay that past to rest in an ordered way, um, instead of the sort of chaotic way where it was in the wrong place and misunderstood and full of secrets and things nobody could say so you dig it up you bring it to light you have a good look and then you lay it to rest um all of you together as a family you know and and um it doesn't mean you can't look back but it means when you look back it doesn't have that chaos or you know that same terror for you you know fr from before so yeah i mean i think it is and again i don't want to you know think of it as a golden bullet i was listening a lot when you were talking and thinking how do you repair you know, and I, th I think of someone like Lani, who I absolutely adore. I think he's the most wonderful person and who's struggling to raise children. And his father was a factory worker and a very well off person comparatively in 1983 when he was killed. And then Lani was raised by a very impoverished aunt and uncle and he, he never had opportunities and he never had a proper schooling. And, you know, how do you give that back to somebody, you know, some decades later? Or how do you measure that damage? And especially in a Zimbabwe that we live in, where 90% of people are in the informal sector. There's almost no formal jobs in this country. We have 300% inflation at the moment. We have teachers on strike. We have, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you the chaos. We've had 
you know, droughts, there's no food to eat. And, and part of that is, is just inflicted by politics. And of course, we're dealing with the Ukraine and the fact that, you know, there's no wheat in, for aid now, you know, so, so the calamities are just so multifactorial. Um, you know, the, the amount of healing that one can do by giving people bones back Yes, you know, I, I think it is very powerful for families, but it's also not an adequate means of reparation in this macro context, um, you know, that we are all living in, which is this chaotic world hurtling who knows where. And we, I live in a very, very poor part of it. Yes, <laughs> very much so in advocacy. I have learned the best advocacy is what I call informed advocacy. That's why we, we can't just come and say, please do this. We have to show facts and to specify. Uh, and uh, and to, to, the, to that webinar I, I mentioned before, Hawk, it's not only not knowing the names, it's not knowing the pictures, it's not knowing the figures, it's not knowing the places. Uh, there's so much to learn from each human being, actually, if you think of it. Uh, each one of us. Huh? So this is, I can't thank you enough for, do you have any more to each other? If not, we'll go to the audience. The audience has been absolutely complimentary. Both, uh, you can all read the chat with me. You don't need me to do all the reading. Uh, so each one of you has so many um, acknowledgements, kudos, uh, and we have a we have people from all over the world, literally. Um, I do yeah. want to uh, to um, look at two questions that were stated as questions. Uh, Charles, David Tauber, you're still here. I hope. Uh, I. This is uh, a very interesting. First of all, please make sure to be in touch with us after now. Uh, Charles wrote, I'm Charles David Tauber, MD of the Coalition for Work with Psychotrauma and Peace. And he, he, he has the, the website link, so please, uh, you can copy it or... I have lived in the conflict era of Vukovar, Croatia since June 95. We educate, quote, barefoot therapists, also known as peer support, online and without charge in various parts of the world. My concern, he says, is the absolute incapacity to work with these traumas in the community. I would like to ask the panel as to how they think we can go about this. My view is that this is critical. We all agree that this is critical. Does any one of you want to? Um, I, 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 Charles, I think the whole field is about this, but uh, so please stay in touch. But any one of you wants to? comment on this. You each have what to say. You mm. already said it in some ways. Shari, you're unmuted. Go ahead. <laughs> sure, okay. Um, yes, no, I mean, I think that's great. And we do a lot of similar work ourselves, actually. Um, to, you know, training training people, you know, there's been talk here of, of maybe, I mean, I, I don't know how, how genuine it is to, to start to have hearings around these massacres, uh, the Gokuro Hindi massacres as they're known. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing was we've been working with the traditional leaders and training, trying to train at least 30 or 20 psychosocial support people for each chief 
um, so that if they start to have hearings, there will be some psychosocial support that, you know, it won't just be a, a case of people standing up and telling their horrible stories and, and not, you know, nobody knowing what to expect, you know, um, in terms of, you know, what that can be like, um, you know, for victims and for those listening, how much anger there can be, how much pain there can be, um, and so on. So we've been doing a lot of that work. Um, yeah, but and and again, barefoot, you, you know, and and very much um, sort of band aid kind of training. Uh, but I I still think that that's important. And I noticed there was a question in the chat which was similar from Craig Higson Smith, who was saying, "Is it okay to sort of have less intensive and more supportive interventions?" And in my experience, it is. You know, and and thank goodness. And and of course. You know, I think you get your pyramid like this, don't you? And you get a small number of people at the top who really need that kind of specialist care. And you get a lot of people at the bottom who need a helping hand and then will be able to actually move on um, in a lot of ways, um, you know, without having to have years of psychotherapy, which is just as well, as well because I think in Zimbabwe, there's not even a dozen, um, you know, psychotherapists in, in my city of, you know, over a million people. Yeah, I'd, I'd also okay. like to comment on Craig's, Go ahead. Um, Craig's comment question, because he's also addressing the refugee crisis. And anyone who's worked in refugee camps or worked with people coming just from refugee, it is a crisis. It's another systemic problem. Um, and when I think about uh, people I've met, coming out of refugee camps, um, it's not a safe place. The refugee camps are not safe. There's ongoing exploitation happening within the camps by other refugee groups and also people that have been employed to protect. They're not protecting. And I think that's another issue we have to look at. I mean, I know I'm going up into the <laughs> other issues, but when I think about training individuals and and they do i mean i think definitely i mean that's something that i have done over the years is trained local providers to respond to their community's psychological needs um i think it's definitely a good path to take but i also know that in order to provide support there has to be a safe space mm -hmm. and so i think something has to be done to address safety in these refugee camps as well. Uh, uh, okay, it occurs to me that actually each one of your centers builds a community of sorts. Uh, how, about, how about elaborating? Yeah, I would love to say thank you for the question. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I really hold fast to this notion that it doesn't have to be therapy to be therapeutic and that the needs are so vast and so targeted that there are a lot of different ways to engage and i know a struggle for me is how do i focus on possibilities as opposed to just being stuck in terms of the limitations and we see clients coming in who are medically trained who have their own degrees and this and that and there's no way that we can turn them into peer whatever here within a hospital framework that's you know medicaid and this and that so if i focus on the things that i can't do i will literally go crazy um but how do we focus on the possibilities what is it that we can provide um that is therapeutic even if we're not able to you know be at the top end of that pyramid what can we provide for the community and um, when Yael introduced me, she talked a little bit about the group Now We Own that we had created during this uh, Sierra Leonean Civil War and all of that sort of stuff. And we started literally by passing a hat so that we could send out a mailing to get a little bit more so we could even take people out to brunch who didn't have anywhere to go, who didn't have any friends in the community. We bought some gloves because it was winter time and folks didn't have this. I mean, there were so many needs um, that we were able to do some things. Now, something I've been talking about a lot over the last few weeks at presentations, and especially with the pandemic and everything that we as service providers in the field have been dealing with, it can feel like no matter what we do, it is insufficient because it's not enough. But 
holding on to the fact that everything you are doing is important. Mm -hmm. Everything you are doing is necessary. Mm -hmm. And even if it isn't sufficient to solve the entire problem, what's going on in your area of Croatia, what you are doing is extraordinarily needed and necessary. Try to hold on to that. And I think the more we focus on the possibilities as opposed to just the limitations, the better off we are in terms of sticking to this because the world needs the, the service. Yeah, when, when it, and as you might recall, we met first time when you were very young. I was too. <laughs> and uh, I came to speak at Bellevue for, you know, to speak about uh, the lessons we've learned from the group project to Holocaust survivors and their children. And indeed, we built a community and the whole focus on group, group therapy as a modality, acknowledges the notion of family community uh, in it. Um, and uh, I, yes, one of the challenges here, and I want to pick up uh, also Linda McDonald uh, referred to her book with Jean Sarson that we would most likely have a webinar about. So I'm not going to, to talk about it too much, but uh, they talk about supporting women who were tortured and trafficked by their families. Um, and, and I said to Carla, you know, here we are, people are going to talk about torture in, in a language way that may or may not have to, have to do with the law use of the word. So maybe you'd want to come in very briefly on that. But what I want to, from a legal standpoint, but uh, what I wanted to talk about for, for a very um, brief moment, is the need for education in the community, of any community. It, it, communities uh, should know their rights. Communities should know, members of communities should know they have rights. They should also know when they don't have rights, what to do in order to perhaps fight for those rights. But they also um, have to look at um, what about the traditions, the cultures, etc., perhaps maintains the trauma that we want to especially attend to? For example, uh, and we will have webinars on that, uh, our communities where women at our next webinar will be on Bosnia and Herzegovina because of the uh, July 11 um of, of reservoirs of the genocide in uh in Srebrenica. Um uh, women who were raped as a weapon of war or in any in, or any weapon. Does their communities values the traditions, the religious tradition and beliefs make their post-rape life? worse mm -hmm. or is it providing healing in the community does the community hold the kind of values that promote healing that enable healing so i just wanted to throw this out for everyone to either comment to or, or just think about uh, but we should sort of uh, conclude this part. And uh, you as the panelists, as I promised, uh, have a last, have a, an opportunity for last word. Please, Mary, uh, let's start from the end. Carla, you start. <laughs> Thank you, Yael. And thank you to, uh, to all the other panelists. It was a pleasure to be part of this event. And I think our, our combined different ways of looking at things uh, comes together to provide quite a 
broad picture, which is really helpful. My own perspective on this work is, and it, it is that sometimes, particularly on the legal side, there's this tendency to put things in boxes. And, and here you do get with the, the torture definition, um, there's a tendency of governments to try to uh, have as narrow a definition as possible so that um, anything outside of the little box that is torture is permissible. But I think the problem with that, of course, is that just because it's not torture doesn't mean it's not it's permissible. So and and I I, I think it it's it's wrong in that sense. Um, but also from the other side, there's this tendency to want to try to fit everything within the torture framework. I've been tortured. I you know, but there one doesn't need the label to have some kind of legitimacy on the suffering. Uh, suffering exists in a variety of different forms. And what's important is what we do with it and how we treat it and how we ensure that it doesn't happen. So my, my view on that is, is that we need more work across different disciplines and more types, more, more broader kinds of reflection on how to address harm and how to ensure harm doesn't happen in the first place. I stop there. Thank you. Uh, I, I, we do have one question that I want to at least acknowledge. Uh, this is from Emmanuel from Rwanda. I found the discussion very interesting. Just to ask a question, uh, for people who had suffered multiple traumas, where do you start? What are interventions planned after an assessment? When do you, when you do not know which trauma are starting with, do start on working with symptoms. I need more clarification. <laughs> Emmanuel, that's just about the toughest question in the whole field of trauma. And you have to, from now on, attend all our webinars because each webinar tries to address that. And we do have uh, uh, to share with everyone else, all our webinars are recorded and are available on our website, uh, even if you had missed them. So uh, please go there, but Emmanuel, stay in touch with us. And we are working with many organizations and amazing experts in Rwanda who you can, we can put you in touch with, uh, who can also uh, help answer or, or, or disentangle this huge question. <laughs> uh, Shari, your, your last word. If you have one, you'll never have one. You have more. And sure, more. Okay, well, I'll, I'll have a very short last word then, um, and I'll, I'll quote. Clyde Snow, um, who's a forensic anthropologist who trained the Argentinian team. Um, and and I'll, I'll just say, you know, that, that sometimes those who are most tortured to the point that they're dead, um, you know, we shouldn't remember that, forget that they are eyewitnesses. They are very, very important eyewitnesses who, and they deserve a voice. They deserve, a, they have the right to speak and be heard as well. Um, and the bones can say, this is what happened to me and this is who killed me. This is how they did it. This is how I suffered, you know, in the hours prior to my death. Um, and, you know, Clyde Snow said, bones make the best witnesses. They speak softly, but they never lie and they never forget. So um, I'll just leave it there. Uh, I hope your last word. <laughs> Thank you. And again, only, thanks. only for now. Only for now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to everybody. What an amazing panel. And I just wanted to speak briefly um, regarding Emmanuel's question. And um, again, I agree with you, Yael, that he should be in touch not only with you directly in this, but all of us who are here speaking on this. It's not a, uh, a quick 30 second response to something so profound. But one of the things I would say about that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about safety, we've talked, you know, about how to guide folks, but empowerment is such a crucial part. And as Mary talked about, you know, it's not going to be one sort of formula for everyone that comes in. 
the expert in where that conversation might start is that person you're sitting with as a survivor. You know, that this does not have to be something where we create a template and then fit the survivor into that. This is something we co-create with that person that's sitting in front of us and trusting them, helping them to trust themselves. And then we move forward in the way that will be most appropriate. And um, in terms of last words, again, I just want to say thank you. Um, I mean, I'll share. I had a little bit of the Monday morning blues this morning. Like, oh, my goodness, I got this going on. I have another meeting here. This, that I'm running. Like, ah, what's... And being in this environment, in this sort of conversation with folks is something that is such a rejuvenation about that and encouragement. My dad used to always tell me that two watchdogs are 10 times better than one. At first, I didn't figure out the mathematics, but just around somebody <laughs> being able to watch your back, you feel more confident, you can be proactive. And even if it's one of those bad days and you just want to howl at the moon, at least there's someone out there who hears you and understands you. And it can make all the difference in the world. So I want to thank all of you for including me in this. And um, from one watchdog to the others, thank you very much. Woof, woof to you too. <laughs> Right, and I'll and I'm very happy that you mentioned uh, the the traumatized individual as the expert. I totally agree with you. And Emmanuel, uh, actually listening to that expert might lead you away to know what to focus on. Uh, just what Hawk said, we listen to each other, it enriches all of us. And we learn and it takes and we go forward from there. So Mary, last, your last right. words. Well, as similarly to, to Hawk's comment, it's just been a great experience having this conversation with everyone. Um, and I, you know, I, it just brings to mind, this is a complex issue, right? There's so many aspects to provide, looking at torture, there's the legal component. And, you know, to me, I, I guess at this point in, in my professional life, I keep coming back to advocacy. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's such an important component. And I feel like those of us who've done the work, our work informs the need for advocacy. And to keep that in mind, right? We, we and our clients, you know, the survivors, they are the best advocates um, whenever possible. I think advocacy done by the actual victim survivor or their family members is so powerful. Um, so again, to Emmanuel, you know, it, it also goes back to who's the real expert and, and it's the survivors. And it's been an honor to be with all of you. And it's been such an amazing professional experience to work with so many survivors who, although they don't like to be called courageous, they are courageous. Absolutely. And they're inspiring to all of us. Uh, th there's so much to say. This is the frustration of we could we could hold a whole week seminar, as you could see. And and just to make a little connection here, of course, every webinar we do is uh, an advocacy road. Because as I said, informed advocacy is what has a chance to make a difference. And we, as you see, we provide knowledge, we exchange knowledge, and hopefully um, decision makers will learn from us as well. And I want to, to uh, inform you of the immediate future uh, webinars, so and invite all of you to attend. As I mentioned before, our next webinar on Wednesday, July 13, following the day commemorating the genocide in Bosnia, our webinar's participants will be children of survivors of that genocide, including those born of rape and orphans, of course. 
on August 9, the International Day of the World's Indigenous People. Uh, this, again, we, that will be at three in the afternoon to accommodate different uh, time zones. We will hold a webinar on the multi-generational legacies of the infamous residential schools. Um, and so please join us. I, I will not say too much about more future webinars, but as you see, every webinar in each one of your questions inspires yet another one. So please know we are here to be inspired as well as to inspire. Uh, I don't have enough words to, for, to thank the, this, these colleagues. Uh, each one, I don't need to say, is brilliant and knowledgeable and all these. <laughs> and I'm so proud to be associated with you and to have you associated with us. Uh, and I can't wait to, to learn more from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone who joined us.